Then Philemon lifted his voice and taught them, saying, And this is the first sermon to the dead. Now here, I begin with nothingness. Nothingness is the same as fullness. In infinity, full is as good as empty. Nothingness is empty and full. You might just as well say anything else about nothingness, for instance, that it is white or black or that it does not exist or that it exists. That which is endless and eternal has no qualities, since it has all qualities. We call this nothingness or fullness the pleroma. Therein both thinking and being cease, since the eternal and endless possess no qualities. No one is in it, for he would be then distinct from the pleroma, and would possess qualities that would distinguish him as something distinct from the pleroma. In the pleroma, there is nothing and everything. It is fruitless to try to think about the pleroma, for this would mean self-dissolution. Creation is not in the pleroma, but in itself. The pleroma is the beginning and end of creation. It pervades creation, just as the sunlight pervades the air. Although the pleroma is altogether pervasive, creation has no share in it, just as a wholly transparent body becomes neither light nor dark through the light pervading it. We are, however, the pleroma itself, for we are part of the eternal and the endless, but we have no share therein, as we are infinitely removed from the pleroma, not spatially or temporally, but essentially, since we are distinguished from the pleroma in our essence as creation, which is confined within time and space. Yet because we are parts of the pleroma, the pleroma is also in us. Even in the smallest point, the pleroma is endless, eternal, and whole, since small and great are qualities that are contained in it. It is nothingness that is whole and continuous throughout. Only figuratively, therefore, do I speak of creation as part of the pleroma, because actually the pleroma is nowhere divided, since it is nothingness. We are also the whole pleroma, because figuratively the pleroma is the smallest point in us, merely assumed, not existing, and the boundless firmament about us. But why, then, do we speak of the pleroma at all, if it is everything and nothing? I speak about it in order to begin somewhere and also to free you from the delusion that somewhere within or without there is something fixed or in some way established from the outset. Every so-called fixed and certain thing is only relative. That alone is fixed and certain that is subject to change. Creation, however, is subject to change. Therefore, it alone is fixed and determined because it has qualities. Indeed, it is quality itself. Thus we ask, how did creation come into being? Creatures came into being, but not creation, since creation is the very quality of the pleroma, as much as non-creation, eternal death. Creation is ever-present, and so is death. The pleroma has everything, differentiation and non-differentiation. Differentiation is creation. It is differentiated. Differentiation is its essence, and therefore it differentiates. Therefore man differentiates, since his essence is differentiation. Therefore he also differentiates the qualities of the pleroma that do not exist. He differentiates them on account of his own essence. Therefore he must speak of those qualities of the pleroma that do not exist. You say, what use is there in speaking about a it at, oh, what use is there in speaking about it at all? Did you not yourself say that it is not worth thinking about the pleroma? I mentioned that, to free you from the delusion that we are able to think about the pleroma. When we distinguish the qualities of the pleroma, we are speaking from the ground of our own differentiated state and about our own differentiation, but have effectively said nothing about the pleroma. Yet we need to speak about our own differentiation so that we may sufficiently differentiate ourselves. Our nature is differentiation. If we are not true to this nature, we do not differentiate ourselves enough. We must therefore make distinctions between qualities. You ask, what harm is there in not differentiating oneself? If we do not differentiate, we move beyond our essence, beyond creation, and we fall into non-differentiation, which is the other quality of the pleroma. 
we fall into the Pleroma itself and cease to be created beings. We lapse into dissolution and nothingness. This is the death of the creature. Therefore, we die to the same extent that we do not differentiate. Hence, the creature's essence strives towards differentiation and struggles against primeval, perilous sameness. This is called the Principum Individuationis. That's an alchemical term. The principle is the essence of the creature. From this, you can see why non-differentiation and non-distinction pose a great danger to the creature. We must, therefore, distinguish the qualities of the pleroma. These qualities are pairs of opposites, such as the effective and the ineffective, the fullness and the emptiness, the living and the dead, the different and the same, light and darkness, hot and cold, force and matter, time and space, good and evil, beautiful and ugly, the one and the many, etc. The pairs of opposites are the qualities of the pleroma that do not exist because they cancel themselves out. As we are the pleroma itself, we also have all these qualities in us. Since our nature is grounded in differentiation, we have these qualities in the name and under the sign of differentiation, which means, first, these qualities are differentiated and separate in us. Therefore, they do not cancel each other out, but are effective. Thus, we are the victims of the pairs of opposites. The pleroma is rent within us. Second, these qualities belong to the pleroma, and we must possess and live them only in the name and under the sign of differentiation. We must differentiate ourselves from these qualities. They cancel each other out in the pleroma, but not in us. Distinction from them saves us. When we strive for the good or the beautiful, we forget our essence, which is differentiation, and we fall subject to the spell of the qualities of the pleroma, which are the pairs of opposites. We endeavor to attain the good and the beautiful, yet at the same time we also seize the evil and the ugly, since in the Pleroma these are one with the good and the beautiful. But if we remain true to our essence, which is differentiation, we differentiate ourselves from the good and the beautiful, and hence from the evil and the ugly. And thus we do not fall under the spell of the Pleroma, namely into nothingness and dissolution. You object. You said that difference and sameness are also qualities of the Pleroma. What is it like if we strive for distinctiveness? Are we, in so doing, not true to our own nature? And must we nonetheless fall into sameness when we strive for distinctiveness? You must not forget that the Pleroma has no qualities. We create these through thinking. If, therefore, you strive for distinctiveness or sameness or any qualities whatsoever, you pursue thoughts that flow out of you that flow to you out of the Pleroma, thoughts namely concerning the non-existing qualities of the Pleroma. Inasmuch as you run after these thoughts, you fall again into the Pleroma and attain distinctiveness and sameness at the same time. Not your thinking, but your essence is differentiation. Therefore, you must not strive for what you conceive of as distinctiveness, but for your own essence. At bottom, therefore, there is only one striving, namely the striving for one's own essence. If you had this striving, you would not need to know anything about the Pleroma and its qualities, yet you would attain the right goal by virtue of your own essence. Since, however, thought alienates us from our essence, I must teach you that knowledge with which you can bridle your thoughts. The dead faded away, grumbling and moaning, and their cries died away in the distance. Okay. So that was nine minutes of maybe gobbledygook. <laughs> it's very difficult to parse, and I hesitated to stop reading and provide some sort of interpretation or analysis because that would take up far too much time. So instead I chose to read this unabridged, but hopefully we can we can chew on these words a little bit and in the future we can try to dissect what they mean. Right now we're just recording. So I'm gonna keep on recording. Um, yeah, so there's a little bit more here.
in the, the first Sermon of the Dead that I'm going to keep in this video, and then I'll do another video for the second Sermon of the Dead. All right. But I turned to Philemon and said, My father, you utter strange teachings. Did not the ancients teach similar things? And is it and was it not a reprehen reprehensible heresy removed equally from love and truth? Why do you lay out such a teaching to this horde, which the night wind swirled up from the dark blood fields of the west? My son, Philemon replied, these dead ended their lives too early. They were seekers and therefore still hover over their graves. Their lives were incomplete since they knew no way beyond the one to which belief had abandoned them. But since no one teaches them, I must do so. That is what love demands, since they wanted to hear, even if they grumble. But why do I impart this teaching of the ancients? I teach this way because their Christian faith once discarded and persecuted precisely this teaching. But they repudiated Christian, Christian belief and hence were rejected by that faith. They do not know this, and therefore I must teach them, so that their life may be filled and they can enter into death. But do you, O oh wise Philemon, believe what you teach? My son, Philemon, replied, why do you raise this question? How could I teach what I believe? Who could give me the right to such belief? It is what I know how to say, not because I believe it, but because I know it. If I knew better, I would teach better. But it would be easy for me to believe more. Yet should I teach a belief to those who have discarded belief? And I ask you, is it good to believe something even more if one does not know better? But I retorted, are you certain of the thing that things are really as you say? To this Philemon answered, I do not know whether it is the best that one that I do not know whether it is the best that one can know, but I know nothing better, and therefore I am certain of these things that are as I say. If they were other words, I would say something else, since I would know them to be otherwise. But these things are as I know them, since my knowledge is precisely these things themselves. My father, is that your guarantee that you are not mistaken? There are no mistakes in these things, Philemon replied. There are only different levels of knowledge. These things are as you know them. Only in your world are things always other than you know them. And therefore, there are only mistakes in your world. After these words, Philemon bent down and touched the earth with his hand and disappeared. Okay, that's enough for now.